Initially at the start, when we're living pretty tight back in, say, Bonnie Rick, because that was, I guess, where he was starting his business. I remember many times he'd come home and say you know, to mum, why'd you buy that? You know, what's what's the need for that? So you'd always see it. You see it and you kind of go, okay. And he wouldn't even let me buy simple things like, you know, things that are not, not like toys. He'd always say, you got to buy stationery for school, clothes for you know, living. Those are the necessities. You only buy those. Don't buy things that are sort of like luxuries. luxuries. And then, you know, many years later, he goes to buy some brand new Mercedes. <laughs> brand new BMW, like, Driving around an AMG. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now on to today's episode. In this episode, we're joined by Tyrone Shum, property manager, podcaster, YouTuber, and serial entrepreneur. With 10 years of experience in project management under his belt, Tyrone is now the host of the popular Property Investory podcast, showcasing the latest strategies and stories from Australia's most innovative property experts. On the video front, Tyrone is the creator of two popular YouTube channels, boasting over 1.8 million views and over 16,000 subscribers. Tyrone hasn't always had an easy path, facing many challenges along the way, running one business after another, and even closing down a business and making a loss of $24,000 during the global financial financial crisis. In this interview, we also covered how he grew his podcast to over 3 million downloads and the lessons he learned along the way, his entrepreneurial tendencies, why consistency in business is vital, and his evolution as a business owner after starting multiple business ventures. Enjoy the show. All right. All right, Tyrone. So, um, mate, very excited to have you on the show. Thank You're you. one of the biggest property names, um, particularly in the podcast space, right? There's a lot of property podcasts out there. Um, where does the love for property actually come from? Because I know every Aussie loves property, but you, I feel like you're in the game much earlier than most people. So <laughs> where did it all start? All right. Well, if you want to go back to when I grew up, you know, yeah, yeah, let's <laughs> yeah, do I, it. I could go as far back as that. All right. Well, when I was growing up, it was mostly influenced by my father. If I start there, that's kind of where it, it kind of introduced to me because growing up, you kind of do what your father asked you to do. It's like, do this, do this, son. You know, slave labor. <laughs> uh, so I think that's where it kind of all started is because growing up, I, I had a very hands-on experience with my father. He, every place that we moved into, he'd renovate it. So mm. even from that first property that we bought back, like, I don't know, when I was maybe about five or six years old, I still remember um, dad was in the garden doing all these kind of renovations. He loved doing the landscaping. Mm. He'd do the paint inside and all that. And this was back at a Bonnie Rick, which is out towards the west in oh, Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we stayed there for many years and very happy. And then he moved into Stratfield or we as a family moved into Stratfield. And that's when he also did a full renovation. By then I was probably about a teenager and he realized, you know, I could actually help, you know, pass that <laughs> drill over there, son, get that <laughs> screwdriver, paint that door. I'm like, oh, okay, thanks dad. Uh, but I think that's where it kind of gave me an insight into it. Not at that time did I realize that when he actually renovated those properties, it increased in value because when he actually had those properties, he probably bought them for like you know a couple hundred thousand, but in a short mm. space of time after putting in the market because he wanted to upgrade and move us to another place, uh, it went up to about 100,000. During that time, that's like a 30% increase. Mm. Obviously now in, in today's time, to get that kind of increase right. is sub substantial for 30%. Mm -hmm. But when you realize how simple it was and you just spend a bit of hours day in day out just to do it he'd have it you know place nicely renovated and would live there you know, for mm. many years enjoying it was he working at a time as well yeah he, he ran his own business like from uh as, as i was growing up and stuff like that we've always seen him run his own business he's never worked for someone else and that business has been very very successful over the last 30 years and then he pretty much just retired and just said look i'm going to work for someone else you know, mm. do a simple, easy job. Oh, so he actually went from being a business owner to working for someone as well. Yeah. Mm. Oh. So that was interesting. And, and I think it's just to give him something to do, to be honest. Oh, so it wasn't like he needed the money. It was just, hey, like I'm good. And now I just want something cruisy, but something to like, yeah. keep my hands busy, basically. Mm. All my other uncles all still run their businesses, but they're still pretty busy. You know, that's the thing. Yeah. So, and it also it's just timing because as things evolved over the time, particularly out West, competition increased. So it was not worthwhile to continue to run his business anyway. And what was he doing? He's in the jury and watch space. Oh. So his trade is a watchmaker. So he, he comes from that you know background where he's always been able to do that. And as you know, watches unfortunately have been sort of a, a slow and dying kind of industry. Mm. People moved over to digital, there's no need for watches, mm. but they're still hardcore, you know, watch 
fanatics and that industry is still sort of, you know, stable, but I don't think it's going to be one that's going to continue to grow. Your family's like from Hong Kong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I feel like it's such a Hong Kong thing, watch and jewelry <laughs> making. I don't know. I feel like there's been multiple people from Hong Kong or families from Hong Kong and yeah. a lot of them in the jewelry or the watch business. Yeah, right? it is. I mean, jewelry seems to be the, the fact that maybe they got attracted to it because there's a lot of profit. You yeah. Know? The profit margins are insane. Hence the reason why those first few years, dad was making a lot of money from his business. Mm. So he could actually, you know, put it back into buying property. Yeah. But, you know, obviously with so much competition, everything's online. I guess people are buying things cheaply and, and mass market. Like you can buy a piece of really cheap jewelry. People won't even notice the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, how much is it going to be valued? Yeah. So, mm. well, before we keep going down into like you getting into property as well, um, now that we're already talking about like you growing up and stuff mm. like that. So you said you grew up in Bonnerig, then you moved to Strathfield as well. Um, you were born in Australia? Yep. yep. Okay. And then what was a, uh, you know, childhood like for you? It was pretty active. Um, it's funny you asked me that question now because I'm thinking about my own kids right now and, my kids have a completely different, I guess, upbringing compared to how I was. Um, and, and this is probably typically because of this generation. Most kids nowadays are kind of sheltered. They're inside the house. They're driven to their school. They're driven to classes, all that kind of stuff. Even sports activities, you kind of drive them there. For me, when I grew up, I was actually free to do anything I want. Like my parents wouldn't even know where I was for the whole day. <laughs> Not kidding. Seriously, I'd be hopping on my bike. I'd be leaving at like 10 a.m., go with the mate to go bike riding. And back then we never had mobile phones. So they couldn't track you. They couldn't track you, exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. And, and I wouldn't be back till like three o'clock in the afternoon. We'd three, drive- Three o'clock only? Like at what, oh, not 10? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a bit early, isn't it? Yeah. I got tired, you know, that's probably why. It's too much bike riding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, like no one would know where we were. So if something did happen, we'd have to rely on ourselves just go to the local shops and say hey you know can we just borrow your phone and make a call mm. remember those days we had phones you just pick up and you know, the telstra pay phones yeah, yeah. telstra pay phones wow. so it's a completely different opposite way and the reason why i raise that is because it, it's also impacting the way our kids uh, are growing up as well because i wish that our kids go, go out and, and freely just play around a lot more socialize with neighbors and stuff because we used to do that like mm. i met my really, really close friends um, because of my neighbors. And because we, we just kind of just went, hey, you know, how's it going? We just socialized and formed these bonds. And, you know, those friendships last forever, whereas I don't even know my neighbors at all, to be honest. Is that because everyone's just inside on everyone's their screens? social media now. So. Yeah, so that, that's completely revolutionized. But coming back to, I guess, where I grew up, um, I had a very, I guess, encouraged and supportive environment where my, my father, he was quite a, a hard man, you know, he, he bit blunt and so forth at times mm -hmm. but i think at the end of the day he taught me a lot about business he taught me a lot about you know property and all that kind of stuff so mm. that kind of upbringing really helped but he also was able to at the same time not worry too much about what i do because he gave me a lot of responsibility so hence the reason why i've grown up to have a lot more freedom you know i i don't really mind so much in terms of where i go and stuff like that and that that was because at an early age my father was busy working so he just said you know go and play so i'm like all right <laughs> do whatever mom I want. wasn't strict either she mom well th this is the thing mom passed away very early unfortunately right, okay. um when i was like about end of primary school okay. she she um had, had a bit of a incident with um yeah i guess pneumonia and then that kind of accelerated and unfortunately yeah, yeah just so passed. that was like a single father just looking after you for, and, and for about a year or so after mum passed and then he got remarried oh, yeah nice. so that that really made a difference so at that point in time it was very very tough and i think at the end of the day dad did what he did you know he had to run a business at the same time mm -hmm open seven days a week, unfortunately. And, you know, he needed some support. And luckily we had a you know, family and friends to support us during that tough time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, found someone and, and married and since then. They've been together yeah. since, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any siblings, I guess? I well? do, big family of four. Oh, okay. He's so the oldest? I'm, I'm the oldest, yeah. Uh, hence uh, why he's uh, he's giving you all the responsibility. Exactly. Well. I felt like the youngest that I actually grew up with, she felt like my own little child because the age gap difference is about 18 years between us. Whoa, okay. 18 years, wow. Yeah. And it's, that's the- um, Second. Obviously- um, yeah. Yeah. Sister. Step sister, yeah. yeah. I still call her my sis, you know. Um, of course, but yeah. Ultimately, yeah. So we've got two two um, siblings who are stepsisters, and uh, so step brother and stepsister, and then my real sister, my blood uh, sister, is about five years difference mm. to me. So we've got pretty big gaps in between, mm -hmm. but we all grew up together, you know, very much, very pretty. Yeah, we had all our kind of open times where we could play with each other and get mm. out and do family trips and stuff like yeah. that. Did you feel like there was any incidents of you realizing that you guys were not that well off or were you, did you feel like your parents um, looked after you and made sure that you had the money that you needed? That's interesting because I think growing up when I was living out towards Bonnie Rick, um, dad was very 
tight on money, I think, it, at that point in time. So I kind of got a lot of um, ingrained values from that because he always kept telling me, don't spend money and waste and stuff like that. And even today, I'm, I'm quite frugal mm. as it stands. And I think that's where I kind of picked it up at an early age. Because at that point in time, when you're growing your business, you go just, you know, keep your cash tight and so forth. So he hated, you know, us wasting money and stuff like that. But as, as the business grew and we, we moved into a comfortable um, house around around the Glazeful area, um, things kind of sort of loosened up. And we, I guess you can say we're living in sort of a middle class kind of environment, which mm. I don't think there was much there. Like we'll drive around very comfortably. Um, Dad sent me to private schools and, you know, with private school in, uh, tuitions, it costs co- quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, there's private school, uh, sports and all that kind of stuff. So I was very fortunate when I got to about high school, things really, really, you know, started to show. And I think also too, looking back at it, it was because of also those properties that dad had purchased, because if he didn't purchase those ones in Stratfield, he wouldn't be able to afford, you know, the, the bigger house that we had in, in Glacefield. And um, yeah, that's why I think I also had a huge influence from that side of things as well too. Oh, so you could see the direct impact on your quality of life as definitely. a result of your dad investing. So that was like a very vivid thing for you as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he didn't invest in the way that I've learned that, you know, I guess I've interviewed so many people. I've seen so many ways of investing. Yep. He was more or less just buying and selling, like buy, reno and sell. Yep. And, and obviously he made money from doing that plus injection of his business and so forth. And if he had just basically just continued to do that path, I think he'd be in a different position where he is. But obviously with times changing in the market and so forth, um, there's a little bit of a, a rough patch for him for that time period as well too. So yeah, it, it, but I did definitely see and lots and lots of lessons learned from all that as well too. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I find that the older generation, their whole life is around revolving about money and education for the all kids. All the time, around the dinner table, dad would come home and talk about <laughs> business all the time. Yeah. I'm like, we'd be watching TV one minute and he's talking about this client doing this and this and this. And like, it's always in the ear, hence the reason why I was in business as well. Yeah. Mm. I never knew or understood what it was like to be actually in the corporate because we never came from that background. And did you ever feel like when you were young, it impacted you negatively or did, did you feel like always that you were so interested in it and you learned a lot? If I was a kid back then, I would have yeah. just went, I want to just go play games. Yeah, <laughs> th- that's exactly what I wanted to do as well too I, because there's a lot of pressure to try and yeah. please dad, I guess you can say, because he was trying to expecting me being the eldest and me also being the eldest in across the whole immediate family, not just my own family, but the Shum family, they kind of put a bit of pressure to go, okay, you know, Tyron's going to do really, really well. I'm like, I haven't done anything yet. (laughs) (laughs) So that that kind of pressure also came on, which is hence the reason why I kind of drifted towards starting business, thinking in the back of my mind, I could really succeed, but it's not as easy. And and you guys know, Mm -hmm. starting a business is is hard work. Mm -hmm. And if you can't succeed in the first three or five years, it's, it's, you know, pretty much a, a downhill from there. Luckily I did small things, but, I pretty much spent all my time there. And looking back at it in hindsight, if I had actually instead of gone into business and went straight into corporate just for those first few years, I think the outcome would have been slightly different because then I would have picked up experience because you learn the things in business by yourself and you just kind of have to, you know, stumble along, make a mistake and then learn from that and then keep going. Whereas in corporate, you kind of pick up things much, much faster because of the large experiences that you have. Mm. And if you don't get that opportunity, it's it's different. So you went straight into business. Yeah. Was it right after university or? Pretty much. Wow, so what was the first uh, first business? So first business was in vending machines. Vending oh, we, we were even talking about this <laughs> a little while ago. I hate Is that it. a good business model? No, no. I, I yeah. hate it. I hate it. I, think I hated it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, it sounds great because I got the idea from Rich Dad Porter and Robert Kiyosaki's book yeah. and he was talking about laundrettes and stuff like that and that was great. And I thought, man, if I could find that kind of stuff, I'd do it. But, you know, I couldn't find anything that I could afford at that time. Hmm. So I went and bought some vending machines, which I could just chuck some snacks and food <laughs> and stuff yeah. in there. Initially, it was good for, for the start of the first few months. But after a while, it was tedious because I had to go and fill it up, mm. put coins in, blah, yes. blah, blah. And the machine doesn't work sometimes. It's broken. And yeah, yeah you can't. You, the problem with vending machines, just so everyone knows, is that you can't outsource the work. No. You have to do it yourself. Or if you outsource it, you don't know what happens to the money. <laughs> like that's the problem. You gotta really trust and, that person. And then yeah. people were saying that technology, like, you know, you can just use the technology, but the problem is technology doesn't always work. Yeah. It just doesn't. There's no internet connection. You have to get the internet there. 
um, somehow. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a, a headache. Hard business. Well, this yeah. would have been pre internet days. Yes, yes. this was pre internet days. Yeah. That's why I had to do it. And, you know, I couldn't afford one of those safeguard guys covering up and taking my money. <laughs> you know, all my profits. Armour guards. Yeah, yeah armour guards or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It, but how did you get the money to get run into that, start that? Well, this is the thing. As I mentioned, growing up, I was quite frugal. So I saved a lot of money. Like, to even get my first property, I, I probably saved up for a few years all the money that I received from, you know, red packets and dad, you know, giving oh. me some, some, I guess, pocket money, but also working as well too. And all that money I used towards buying these machines and also putting a bit into property as well. So that's how I kind of got started. And then from there, I thought, all right, we could try and generate some cash flow. And I counted every dollar. That's the thing. I, I was like, you know, every dollar I try and make, I try and put away. But, mm -hmm. you know, over time, when you learn about business, it's not that easy to actually go, okay, I can count everything. You just got to factor in some of the extra costs and stuff. It's strange that you're like that because like, you know, if you look at the kids these days or our generation, we mm. don't spend, like we don't put all our money into like starting a business. No. So how did you kind of, like, is it from parents, like from your dad? Oh, definitely. I, yeah. as, I, as I think I learned from him, initially at the start when we are living in pretty tight back in, say, Bonnie Rick, because that was, I guess, where he was starting his business. I remember many times he'd come home and say, you know, to mom, why'd you buy that? You know, what's, what's the need for that? Yeah, so you'd always see it. You see it and you kind of go, okay. And he wouldn't even let me buy simple things like, you know, things that are not, not like toys. He'd always say, you got to buy stationery for school, clothes for you know living. Those yeah. are the necessities, only buy those. Don't buy things that are sort of like- Luxuries. Luxuries. And then, you know, many years later, goes to buy some brand new Mercedes. <laughs> brand new I'm like, Dad. Driving around an AMG. <laughs> exactly. So money changes, you know, yeah. a person. And, and I guess I didn't, hadn't actually changed with it because even though dad had those and by that age, I was able to drive all those cars, I didn't feel any different. Mm -hmm. And then when people, you know, say, oh, you know, drive me a nice car, I'm going, yeah, I kind of lived in that. It doesn't feel any different. It's like mm. initially when you get a high, go, yeah, it's a brand new car and you drive it. But when you have it for like a few years, you go, yeah, it's okay. You know, it's mm. just a lot, not a car. Get for me, it's like a few months. I get over it straight away. Like any luxury good, whatever. Yeah. So I just end up not spending the money that I need now anymore. And that's exactly yeah. right. And that's, that's why I guess I've learned from that experience because growing up I had that because I saw my dad spend too much money, which got him into more trouble. And that has led him to, you know, where he is oh, today sometimes as well. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, he, he just buy new stuff all every week because there's so much cash flow coming in from the business. And it's all cash. It's all cash. <laughs> I don't know if you found it weird when you were a kid because you were like, dad's telling you you can't buy luxury stuff. But on the flip side, he's buying like all this luxury stuff. Were you like, what the hell? Like, it's the timing, right? At the start, like he probably was more frugal. And then when he started- Well, how old were you when he yeah. was starting to, you know, do really well and starting to, you know. <sighs> Probably in year seven, year seven or so eight. you're still in high school. Yeah, still in high school. So I, I, I understood all that. Primary school was different because primary school, we moved around a lot as well. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, my mother passed away when I we was quite young. So and during that period- He was renovating as well. He was renovating, yeah. yeah. And and I pretty much changed school three times within cool. that, that period. So I never had that stability. Luckily we had a stable home, but it was just a school environment. So I didn't really remember too much about that because mm. so much happened. Mm. But from that transition, once dad started making a lot of money during that time, yeah, between high school all the way up to university days, I could definitely tell there's a big change in us. But the funny thing is, and, and this is, I think, an Asian mentality that goes back, and I, I see this in myself sometimes, is that even though you're making a lot of money, he still was very harsh in terms of actually saying, you shouldn't be spending on that. It's it's. Uh -huh. A waste of money, you know. Um, he was a bit tight on certain things. I'm going, well, Dad, you're earning enough. Why, why do you need to be so tight? Mm, it's a survivor <laughs> mentality. Isn't it's it? still that survivor. Yeah. So it's just changing that mindset. And maybe it was because every time cash flow wasn't so good, because, you know, with business, they're always up, up and down. down. You know, maybe that month was crap. So <laughs> some yeah. can't spend that. But next month, hey, let's just go buy you know, a new thing. <laughs> Loves the <of> dinner. <laughs> exactly. So it, it's interesting how, I guess, it's all based on that kind of emotion. Whereas, mm. Coming back to property, what I like about it is the passive income that's residual, but also consistent, mm -hmm. you know? And, and if you can kind of get that kind of stable cash flow, then it allows you to be able to have that kind of certainty. And, and that's where financial freedom comes mm -hmm. into play. So what was the first property you bought? And like, how old were you when you bought it? Straight after uni, I actually, um, I actually spent quite a bit of time into business first. And when I got into business, I thought, all right, well, at that point in time, I better educate myself. So I actually joined up with Steve McKnight's program called Results Mentoring. Mm. And that's where I kind of got involved in looking at buying property. If, if people have read about the book, um, Steve McKnight's Zero to 130 Properties in Three and a Half Years, mm -hmm. that's where it got me that inspiration to go and buy more property or, or even get started in property. So I joined that program 
And within that first probably six months or so, I bought my first property, which was in a regional town. And it was cash flow positive from day one, following the formulas that they taught us and the systems that they they did. And yeah, I was generating cash, a positive cash flow from that. Mm. Mm. Now, that was a, a good property in the sense that positive cash flow, it was you know self-sustained and it was commercial and retail. So commercial downstairs and retail upstairs. Mixed, yeah. So dual income. Um, but the biggest lesson learned from that is regional. <laughs> That's all I can say. Yeah. If, if for anyone who buys regional, you got to be careful because to try and sell it down the track is extremely hard mm-hmm. and you don't get the kind of capital appreciation. So I was going for cash flow and I was not chasing after capital growth. And that's what I learned over these, I guess, decade or so of running you know, business, investing in property that if I was to start all over again, I definitely just don't care about the cash flow. Stick with just, you know, firstly investing into uh, metropolitan cities. And, uh, and, and go for go, uh, asset growth? Asset, yeah, asset growth initially. Mm. Um, because the fact is, is that, you know, those five years, because it took me about five years to sell that, mm. that capital growth that I potentially awesome. had the opportunity cost there in Sydney. Oh, you couldn't liquidate, you couldn't call the money out. No, and I, I could have bought, you know, two properties in Sydney, which would have doubled in value quite easily over those five years. So you lost an opportunity cost. Yeah. It's like yeah, something people don't think about as well, right? Opportunity costs. And that's why we're in, like, when we were talking about this before the podcast is that like, mm. that's why we're so focused on business right now because, mm. you know, the opportunity costs of running our business are, and growing our business compared to like in uh, investing, it's like, we don't have the time for investing. It's exactly yeah. right. And that's what happened for me for the first probably 10 years or seven, seven to 10 years or so running a business. All I did was focus on, on the business, trying to grow it, trying to run it. And then you just lose your time and you realize, hold on, those last 10 years that I've been doing that, was it really worth it compared to, you know, investing into property or whatnot? Mm. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say, but I think all the lessons that I've learned has brought to me where I am right now. Mm. Yeah. So it's yeah. hard to um, to invest in property though with no track record, no mm. profits, no nothing, to, like no financial data to show to the banks because yeah. like you, you'd be just chasing your tail around the place. Yeah. And that's what happened with me for the first few years of running a business because as you know, two years is a minimum to mm. show that you've had a business um, increase. Mm. And even when I did go to the bank to do it, I had to do a low dot loan because I couldn't get mm. a full dot because they just said that I didn't have enough serviceability. Mm. Whereas that's why I look back in hindsight, I've had gone corporate, even just worked for a few years in corporate, it would have built up enough, you know, I guess credit history, enough salary income that proves the bank. And I could have just gone and bought more properties, which is what a lot of my guests have done in the past because yeah. they're all full-time salary earners yeah. and they bought like five or six. And so I'm like, wow. Some would say that like it's a negative that you didn't go into corporate, which is what you're saying, but some would say that it's a positive because sometimes when you get stuck in corporate and – you don't like, question things. Yeah. yeah. You're yeah. told this is the long. way things are done and just yeah. like, oh, okay, cool. Because, you know. And you, it's so specialized too, right? You could just be doing one certain thing in corporate and you don't really learn the whole um, uh, aspects of running a business or making money um, as well. as Sometimes it's just it, the corporate world makes you stuck in there. Like it absolutely. forces you, it teaches you how to, hey, um, work on promotions, like, you know, work, mm. run the politics in, in, in business or not business in corporate world. So I feel, yeah. It, it's exactly right. And this is the interesting thing. If you look back at my journey, I went to business first. Then when my son came along and I got married and we bought a house, that's when I went back into corporate. So I was able to actually see both sides of the coin. Oh, so you went back to corporate. I went back to oh. corporate because we want that stability. Mm. And at that point in time, running the business was just very hard, especially with a, a, a newborn. And it, it just kind of throws your schedule out of whack. Yeah, well, look, if you can walk us through that journey. So we, if we got up to a vending machine, bought first house, was there anything in between that? Oh, yeah. Were you still doing? <laughs> yeah, all right. Walk us through that. I'll, I'll yeah. go through that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so what happened was, uh, after the vending machine business, um, I sold it off, you know, got rid of the machines because I thought this is just too hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a god. <laughs> I'm god, I'm god. Uh, during that time as well, I was actually just getting back into sort of sports stuff. And I was like, uh, one of my passions because of school and so forth, I was always involved and very, very active. So I did athletics. I did, um, yeah, cross country. I did so many different things at, at school. And at that point in time, when you go uni, you kind of either go and play basketball, which is what I did half the time, which mm. is why I flunked out the first year of uni, <laughs> um, chasing after girls, you know, yeah, partying, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But by the end of the last year, before I finished and went out potentially to get work, was that year, I was like, wow, I've got a lot of time because I was only at uni maybe four hours a week. I was like, wow, I've got so much time on my hands. <laughs> so I started exploring, you know, opportunities to do other things, e.g. business, sports activities and one of my friends there actually said to me look you know if you're looking for an activity to do have you ever considered dragon boating and i said no i've never heard of it what the heck is that 
<laughs> all I remember is like dragon and then boat. I'm like, what? <laughs> so anyway, he invited me. I came down. It's usually by down by Glebe, um, where they actually do all the dragon Bay riding. Run, is it? It's sorry near the Bay Run. Near yeah. The, yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. There's one down the Bay Run, but down fish markets. Mm. Oh, okay. Yep, yeah. Yep. It's essentially for people who don't know what dragon boating is. It's, pe- it's twenty people sitting inside this really long boat. Everyone holds a paddle, and you all paddle at the same time. Sounds simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> in sync, right? Exactly. Once it, you're out of sync, it, it, it feels it, weird. It was quite big, um, like, you know, f- a few years ago. Is I think it's still, still big, big, right? Yeah. 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 Well, this is the interesting thing. I went into it just for fun because I wanted to socialize. I want to get some exercise. And there's a lot of great people there, you know, to be able to nice meet girls as well. As well yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I was hinting. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess I, I went in for the social aspect. I didn't actually go in it to care too much about the sport. But when I started doing it and I got good at it and a lot of the coaches started seeing that I was a potential to you know, do really well at it, they gave me an opportunity to trial out for getting into the, the state competition. I said, all right, well, let's have mm-hmm. a go. Mm-hmm. So interesting enough, yes, we made it and we all succeeded. We, we won on that competition and they said, look, would you like to be part of the national team? which is representing New South Wales. Oh. I'm cutting the story short, but this mm. this happened over at least a year or so. Mm-hmm. And you had to obviously um, do your time records. You had to do time trials and, and, and get that all checked out. But once you pass that, you can qualify to get into becoming a state um, yeah, competitor. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. And at that point in time, I was doing really well. Obviously, I was training a few days a week, like three times a week. So it felt like back going back to high school again because mm. you, know, you train and you go and compete on Saturday and you try and win the games and so forth. And every probably weekend while I was training and then competing, I started seeing an opportunity there because interestingly enough is that at that point in time, not many people had what they call um, very good equipment, such as dragon boat paddles and so forth. And they're only just introducing these very, very light paddle weight um, equipment that they were importing from overseas. And, and one person that was doing it was basically the head of dragon boating she was fantastic in the sense that she grew that whole dragon boat community. Um, but the thing is, is that there was no one actually offering a specific service or product specific to those markets locally in Australia. And she was just reaching out to suppliers over there and say, hey, um, all clubs, who wants to order a paddle? Just let me know and I'll just order it. There's no you know, profit margin. She didn't do it for money. She just did it just to help out all the clubs. Uh-huh. And I really wanted one. I thought, wow, you know, I'll speak to her and I said, who, who can we get this directly from? And it, I thought there might be an opportunity if I can try and convince the supply to allow us to ship this across, I could get myself a free paddle. <laughs> That's and what you were focused on. <laughs> I didn't care if I made money as yeah, long as yeah. I could get a free paddle. Yeah. Because these carbon fiber paddles that I'm talking about were literally half the weight, or even sometimes a quarter of the weight of a wooden paddle. A wooden paddle would sometimes weigh up to 800 grams. These paddles only weigh like 350 grams. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I thought, wow, if I could get that opportunity to be able to import this whole stuff across man, I could get a free paddle. Mm. And I said to her, hey, um, her name was Mel back then. And I said, Mel, would you be okay if I just help you manage this? And she said, yeah, sure, you take it over. I don't want to manage this. It's just a headache for me. It's extra work. Mm. And I'm doing this as a volunteer. If you want to do it, just speak to the supplier. So and I got you the saw supp- dollar signs. You're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. So yeah, it, it just turned really funny because I just reached out to the supplier and said, hey, you know, can I you know, order a bunch of paddles? And I said, yeah, for sure. And I said at the same time, do you have anyone who's exclusively selling this guys for you in Australia? No. Would you be interested in doing a deal with me? Yeah, for sure. Let's just see how this first order goes. Oh, so you started straight away. You, you were talking about that because usually in, when I do business, like I, I would just like start building the relationship and yeah. then I ask. So you went right into it. Why not? Because I thought to myself, if I can get a free paddle, can I sell it the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about that free paddle. <laughs> That's so good. All right, and then keep going. Then. So yeah, I guess what happened was I, I did that first batch, and I thought perfect opportunity here to be able to see if I can try and import more paddles, import more gear. And because there was no one exclusively in Australia, I know there was only one guy that was doing it, but he was doing it as a hobby. He just mm. said, if I can set it up, I'll just you know sell whatever I can. But I thought, how could I turn this into a potential business? And there's so much demand and I looked overseas and luckily at that time, the internet was available. So I could go on all the different websites, particularly in the US and Canada, and I just copied the model. And I went, wow, if there are all these other supplies, what if I brought every single one of those supplies and become exclusive distributors for Australia for dragon biting? So how big did it get? Pretty big. I had about like 10 different um, suppliers exclusively. So literally every, I'm not going to say I became a monopoly, but I was almost a monopoly in the Dragon Boat space where I got all the suppliers to pretty much exclusively distribute my wow. process. And the good thing was I didn't do it based on the store because that was the other thing. The other 
um, supplier that was in Australia, he always would just set up a store. So I just thought, one, it's a time, physical store. A physical store right. on, on the actual event. He'd set up his Wait, own paddles. Tent, paddles, bags, wow, everything, okay. all that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to go down that path because I know one, it's time consuming. I got to spend a lot of money buying all the gear, having stock. I got to buy the tent. I got to travel all over. I don't have time to travel all over the country to, to promote these things, which he did. You know, he did that. And I thought, well, why not just set up an online store and then just get the word out there? So when that first batch came through, people saw what we're doing and then heard that, you know, just through word of mouth, I'll go and see Tyrone. He'll get you know, another paddle. And then when I started putting up on the website, we pretty much just turn it all on and said, look, guys, just go to the website and order the paddles. And the beautiful thing about it was that there was no restriction on what we could put on the paddles itself. So we could actually do our free advertising. Of oh, is it you labeled it? Yep. Oh, what was the name of the company? DBV. D- what does that mean? Dragon Boat Ventures. <laughs> ah, and then, so this was like early day e-commerce essentially. So yeah. what year was this? This was probably... Early 2000s. I think it was probably around about 2006. Wow, early. Yeah. You're, you're mm-hmm. an, you had an e-commerce, e-commerce business. It's, it sounds very similar to my, like my e-commerce business. Uh, my one wasn't more like a, a a sporty thing. I just- No, but when like, did you set it up? When did I set it up? About eight years ago. Like, yeah, eight years, 10 years ago. So now- So, okay. So, you were yeah. you were very Rarely, early. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I feel like during like the e-commerce, like eBay was the biggest thing. Mm. And people weren't even considering, they didn't trust buying from an online store. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I didn't even have all the, I guess, connections, how that we have now with payments. You know how nowadays you just hop on, you click on the item. Yeah, Stripe. And and Stripe that. and, and then, yeah. you know, process. Even Amazon, you don't even need to put in your credit card. You just click on it and you give authorization. Mm. Back then, we actually had to, <laughs> we had to actually put the order online. After that, take the credit card details via the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, then wow. process it via our terminal. Right. So you, but can you used to think, oh, wow, this is so good. I'm not collecting cash. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I didn't have to. I mean, the ones that they sent the checks, you're like, oh, bah, I got to walk to the yeah. bank. <laughs> Money orders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, that were the first days. And I don't know if you guys remember, like there was a, a system called Zencart. That's what I used. And, and I just set that kind of system up. I did it all myself. I learned all that by myself and, and pretty much got it all up there. But I guess the word of mouth or how it got out was basically through advertising on our own paddle. We just put our sticker with the website and then that's how people got through. Mm. And then eventually the word got out to all the clubs, got out to all the community that, you know, we're we're the main supply of all these because this is what people wanted. They wanted good quality equipment because I didn't have to produce it. I just had to just distribute it. Um, Supplies that are reliable and then also they can actually do bulk Mm. because the problem was the other dealer couldn't do as many paddles as we could because we're importing so much. We could literally sell in bulk to all the clubs. So when a club, for example, is linked to a school, as an example, they always have some kind of funding from their sports community. Mm -hmm. Every time they get that funding, they either spend it on new gear, e.g. clothing, pants, shorts, paddles. And paddles was one of the main things because if they could shave off many seconds or a few seconds off their time because of a lot of gear, they'll buy it. And that, that's what drove a lot of that. And, and therefore, I wasn't just selling one individual because I wouldn't have survived if I just sold one at a time. <laughs> Imagine bulk. having to get one person come in. I did a lot of bulk. And, and that's how we got a nice big turnover to be able to sell these paddles. Did you end up having a team? Uh, actually, yeah, I did. I, had, I didn't actually hire anyone locally. I hired one overseas, just a virtual assistant. But yeah, pretty much everything was all done by myself most of the time yeah, because, right. you know, it's a sustainable business that I could. I literally turned my garage into storage. Yeah, yeah, as you do. (laughs) As you do, you know. And eventually, I think everything that I just did was just all online. I didn't even bother setting up a store. There's only probably two events I remember, which are the major nationals that I bought a tent and a table and my wife came up with me, which was up at Calandra in Queensland. Mm -hmm. And we just set up a a table there. So that's because everyone was going to be there. Everyone was going to be there. And I thought that would be worth it. So how long did you run this business for? Probably a good four to five years or so. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then by that time, um, we're looking for a place to buy in Sydney and I need some cash. And I thought, oh, well, let's just sell it. So I put it on the market and sold it after that. And sold the business. Sold the business. How, yeah. did, how did it feel selling your first like business? <sighs> it was a relief. I was like, wow, I didn't have to do much work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Get a big paycheck. Yeah, it was good. I, I have to admit, it, it because you put so much heart and effort and time into it, because it's also all about learning, it was just like this huge burden off your shoulder because you still – at that point in time, I was very dedicated to make sure I knew all my clients. I knew what was going on in the community. You just put so much oh, time really and into it, with everyone. into everything. Mm. And, and looking back in hindsight, it was a very, very good learning lesson because for anyone who actually goes into maybe, for example, running a business, this is really 
you know the, the ground groundwork that you need to do the foundations of actually running a successful business yeah i i feel like a lot of um like you know first time business owners they feel like they need to uh find the next big thing yeah but i feel like businesses should be like a stepping stone that's right yeah yep. and that's how i started mine i started the e-commerce business as well when i first did it first did it yeah and i never thought i was gonna be in there making it and to be honest like I, there was a competitor that wasn't like he made a crap load of money doing what i was doing but I just didn't think I had the capability, skill set, um, money, um, and time to do it. Yeah. So I just thought it was just a stepping stone. I made a bit of profit from it. I profited a bit from it, took the cash, and then reinvested it somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, and that's the beautiful thing. Like, as I've learned over the years, even if your business doesn't succeed, in, you know, fails for whatever reason, you learn from that lesson and you go, okay, is this the right way you want to go or this is how you do? Mm-hmm. And, and this is the thing. At that point in time, as I was saying to, to other people I've shared this story with, we were looking to buy a property and we needed some additional cash or I guess um, servicing income to do that. So I thought I'd start a new business at the same time. Mm. And I did jump into multiple businesses. This wasn't my only one. I did multiple businesses at the same time. Oh, while you were doing DBV? Yeah. Oh, wow. mm. Cause the thing is, is <sighs> I guess naturally by heart I'm, I'm entrepreneur, but I can't sit still. <laughs> I've got ADHD. In yeah. it. So I, I kind of got a bit bored in some aspects. Like once the business is running and it's all automated, you, you know that, you know, orders still coming through or you do is process the orders, dispatch them and get your careers and, and all that to pick up. Oh, it's really dry stuff. It's yeah, just, dry stuff. It's like vending machine all over again, 2.0. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, the only way I could have grown it further was probably just to spend more time marketing and, and all that. And it's also seasonal too. It's not like 20, like, you know, 12 times a year in terms mm-hmm. of month wise. I think it only happens about six months of the year if from memory okay. so the rest of the six months you got to find something else to do to, <laughs> so what am i going to do i'm going to sit around start another business yeah, exactly yeah. so that's what that's where it kind of came in and funny thing is my wife came across um an ad for this thing called just a drop and it was like i don't know it's an idea that i thought all right we'll give this a go and this was the first time that you know my current wife and i when we we're together we we're still girlfriend boyfriend was that she said look I think this thing might work. It's basically a little drop that you put in the toilet before you go and do a number two yeah. and that will eliminate or, or mask the odor. Mm. And you think, you know, that seems like a good idea and I'll probably have a good market to, to attract. At that point in time, there's no distributors in Australia and I thought, all right, well, let's just try and replicate the same model to distribute these from Canada and bring in become exclusive supply. So I was trying to take that same business knowledge I had in dragon boating and apply it to the same model. And they said they'll give us plenty of support tell us on how they did it over there successfully because it was a very successful brand in there. It was distributed across their big, big shopping center, so supermarkets and distribution chains, just like how we've got like Woolworths and Targets and all that. And they said, look, the key thing that you got to do is PR. So we thought, all right, we'll, we'll learn from that. And we started that kind of PR kind of marketing and stuff. And we thought, all right, if we could try and set up a website, then we'd have to set up stores and we're just trying to you know, establish these kind of you know online businesses. And that, that's kind of where it got started. Now, the challenge with that was it was a very heavy infantry-based business, which means I had to hold a lot of stock. Mm-hmm. And if I couldn't turn over it fast enough, and it was based on a high volume turnover, then you wouldn't make much profit. And because you're just starting out, you try and sell as many as you can. And the price point was also quite low. You're like looking at like $4, $5. So imagine you got to kind of turn over like millions and millions of these products to make a substantial profit. Mm-hmm. And that's where it kind of got stuck was because we held all this stock. We didn't have enough cash to sustain our business. And we, we just couldn't get enough traction to actually attract. And the reason why was also too, we're probably too early in the market because this stuff, maybe about five years later, came out in a different- Oh, really? Brand. You gotta educate the market. They, they The thing is, no one knows that there's a demand for it. Everyone has smelly it. poos, but they just don't realize they can <laughs> they do something care. about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's an extra cost. Like, why would you go and buy something to add on when you know everyone takes does it for free? So it was that kind of education process. Yes. And we just didn't have the knowledge and experience and to do that. And the money as well. And the money. Time. Yeah, yeah. Because I think in business sometimes, like you've got a good business model, it's just that you don't you don't back yourself in terms of time, and you need to just wait for the right time sometimes. Exactly. And it's like computers and typewriters, right? Like when people when computers came out, they were thinking, "What the heck do we need this? There's yeah, a typewriter, it's faster." Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then it's now like horses and cars. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. exactly. It's a timing, and and you know, for example, the phones. Like it took a while for phones to take off with a smartphone. 
you know, people used to have the Nokias and stuff like that. And they thought, why would I spend money? Like cost twice as much to do it. But luckily Steve Jobs obviously educated the market because he could have everything into it. Mm. And that's where it took off. Mm. And that's where I think we learned from that lesson, that pivot point was that, do we want to be that kind of business where we've got to educate the market, be that pivot? Mm. And I don't think personally I was innovative enough to do that. So that's why I learned from my lessons. I want to go into a business that I kind of already is established because then the hard work is already done and mm-hmm. all I have to do is really just kind like of there's create. existing demand out there for is, it. Is, is that the one that you lost money in? Yes. <laughs> and just and then GFC hit? Yeah, right, GFC hit and stuff. And the, the currency dropped substantially. I think it went from like 75 cents down to about 60 cents right. because we're importing from Canada that we had to exchange. So we literally lost a lot of money on the exchange rate. How much did away. you lose? Oh, it was probably about 20K um, at that point in time. Wasn't that much in comparison to now, but back then, we back were then all, yeah, it was a lot of money for us, you know, just to start a business. And especially when you've got the other business running as well too. So, you know, lesson learned, you just go, okay, well, you know, maybe that's not right for us. And you learn that, okay, maybe you got to find a different business. And this is where I start searching, did a bit of internet marketing, video production, <laughs> podcasting. Mm. Um, I tried all sorts of ways. And, and because I was also still part of the results program, I also delved back into property. And, and at that point in time, I couldn't buy more property because I was already maxed out as it was. Mm-hmm. So what I did was I thought, all right, I could learn to see how I can actually get some properties and try and generate some um, cash flow from that. And the way I did it was I, I could lease properties and then sublease it back out and make a profit margin between. Oh, yeah. oh, they do rooms. that now when you're doing that. Airbnb, right? Yeah, they, a lot it's of, exactly. Yeah. A lot of businesses, that, there's a lot of businesses that are starting to do that a lot now. Yeah. And it's really big in America. It's huge, uh, yeah. But in Australia, it's just start, it's starting to kick off. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts, and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. Um, I want to actually talk about how, how did you get over that hump though? Like, you know, you lost a lot of money. Like you would have impacted. Pick yourself back up. Yeah. yeah. How did you pick yourself back up? Um, I, I think the challenge was that. And you've got all this stock too. Like you go uh, to the garage and you're like, oh my God. You had to do a lot of poos. That's yeah. what basically what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Friends, family, just use it up for me, please. <laughs> and like the shame as well. Like yeah. the shame. Yeah. There's a lot of shame, especially when your parents, uh, like your dad was probably supportive of business, but mm. you know, maybe the, your surrounding um, family, um, you know, you just feel like there's a bit of shame in it that. It probably was, and I, I can't quite remember exactly how it felt, but I could definitely tell my dad was saying, you know, why don't you just go back and get some work, you know, do something else instead rather than do what you're doing. Cause I did have so much freedom. I was working from home, you know, I could go out whenever I wanted. I did, wasn't told by a boss. I didn't work the hours nine to five. I basically, you know, literally worked all, all around the clock kind of thing. Mm. So that flexibility, I didn't want to give up. <laughs> mm. And that's probably what held me back as well. And I, I thought, man, one thing that kind of kept in the back of my mind was tax. I don't know why that was such a big thing for me. I thought if you could, you know, make money in, in a business, you could reduce the amount of tax. But going to the workforce, your tax is taken out straight away for you. So, you know, what you're left in return isn't very, very much. Mm. And that kind of just kept rattling in the back of my mind thinking, oh, you know, if I go back out, I'm, I'm probably going to make less money than what I'm making now. I'm going to have to pay more tax. What's the point? And I'm working more hours as well too. Mm. I freaking love this topic. <laughs> I'm just saying because I'm an accountant. But I, know, like, I know, I was going to say, I, this I, is I, right I, up your alley. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I 100% agree. So the problem is every dollar that you make in your bank account when you're uh, uh, on the payroll, yep. it's tax has been taken out. Exactly. So that's like 20%, 30% or 45%, yep. right? And then you're using 60% of how much you've already made to make more money. And that's a problem because yep. in business, whatever hits your bank account, you can use straight away, which is 100%. That's so right. you're at a handicap. Only a business owner will think that way, which like, <laughs> and, and it's so nice to hear because like for me, I'm just like, man, I cannot see why you want to be handicapped. Like, yeah. and, and on top of that, the tax is so massive. I know. That, that, in, as an individual, exactly. like 45%. Yep. And, and business, is, it now hurts. it's 25%. Yeah, it hurts. And, and that's why I, I kind of hesitate going back in because if I was like, do I have to climb the corporate ladder? Say I earn, you know, $300,000 a year. I'm paying literally almost half of it yeah. to the government. I'm going, all that hard work, <laughs> I could keep that in my pocket. <laughs> You know, reduce it, I mean, legally. So that kept rallying in the back of my head and it took me a while to get that. And I think the reason why that kind of hit me was because of stability in the cash flow. When it, you know, I had my, my son and we had to establish a family, house, 
all that kind of stuff, mortgage, and you want that consistent cash flow. So it kind of went, okay, let's just go. And I was really, really hesitant. And I think you could tell from my demeanor, I was like, I don't want to go back to work, honey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought we need to. So you're just going back, but you just pretend, like you just pretend to go back and so you'll fail anyway. Right? <laughs> Funny thing is after five years, I still stuck there. So wow. <laughs> that's how long I, I stayed. promoted during those days? I did, I did, yeah. <laughs> but this is the thing, you don't realize until you go in, I thought, Oh, this is going to be a dread but when I actually went in I actually really enjoyed it because it was a, a, a breath of fresh air because yeah. I worked by myself a lot and it, it felt like you're missing something mm -hmm. and then when you go in and you meet a thousand people in your company it's like wow this is great oh you're talking about the social aspect, social aspect of it, right? yeah. yeah yeah but you were probably a good problem solver as well so you just kicked ass at work and that's what happened in the first couple of years my boss was going wow how'd you know all this stuff and I said well I've learned it just through my own business and that's why their company grew substantially because of what I did what, what was the job uh, I was a digital marketing manager initially mm -hmm. oh, and wow. yeah, we pretty much did everything. They, they own, well, they're the largest brick manufacturer in Australia. So they own a lot of big well-known brands. And when I first came in, their websites, their social media were absolutely <laughs> shocking. Like, I'm talking about 1990s designs. Yeah, I'm like, wow. what the heck? And, and because I was very fortunate that he put a lot of trust in me initially on, he gave me a budget and he said, look, you know, you try and work out what you can do and then come back to me. So I thought first thing back in my mind, because I'm very good at hiring people, I was able to outsource a lot of work. I went straight away and hired like four full-time Filipinos to do a lot of the work in the background. And he gave me that budget wow. to do. That's why I was able to do so much in such a short period of time. Because that's what I learned when I ran a business is that I can't do everything myself and I needed so much support. And mm -hmm. that's why I had some, such a great team. But at that point in time, I couldn't afford it because you know I didn't have enough cash flow come in. I just didn't have the time to go out and do all this kind of work. So yeah. I mean, I, I talked a little bit about video production. That was my main business after the DBV, after um, mm -hmm. selling just a drop or not, not selling, but um, not able to continue. And then that subleasing business. So I pretty much closed all that down. And that's, I guess, where my next passion drew was the video side of things. And we started that business up. That was running really well, but it was extremely time consuming. Mm -hmm. Cash flow was always up and down. I was chasing after invoices every month. You know what it's like running a business. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, we know what it's like to run a video business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very well, what it's like to run a video business. But yes, go on. So yeah, that's where I kind of um, had to make a decision. And I guess after the discussion with my wife and where we were at that situation, I went in and, and just promoted myself as digital marketing manager because that was probably the closest fit with all my skill set. You know, I couldn't go in and become like a CEO or anything like that, unfortunately. Uh, but it was a good starting point. And that's where I, I just climbed up and yeah, became like pretty much like the head of digital at that point in time. Wow. And then I left. Oh. So what was the decision to leave? Um, I guess it was also oh, redundancy. That's right. It was, mm. oh, okay. yeah, because at that point in time, there was a lot of things that was happening in the company. Um, literally in the, in about a space of a month, we had about four staff all being redundant, which include myself. Business as well. wasn't doing well. What was the reason? It was, yeah, business wasn't doing well, unfortunately. Um, I, can't, I don't know if you guys can remember during that property cycle that's going back almost a five or six years ago, I think it was, mm -hmm. we're going through a downturn mm. and um, the, mm. the construction industry was- 2009 or was it 2000 or was it- Later than that. No, later than that. So 2016 to- 2016. Oh, 16. Oh. It was after, after the boom. Remember after the boom in yes. 2014, 2016? Yeah. Construction starts slowing down, building materials- um, yeah, just the market. Sounds like what's happening right now. Right now, exactly, <laughs> yeah. But it was yeah. a bit of a delay. Like it literally is a year after. And then that's when we realized, man, the profits were not happening because every quarter they have like a, a company-wide um, update, you know, announcement of what's going on. And when mm. they announced that the profit was dropping quite substantially, they had to cut their losses and um, yeah, make people redundant. So that's what happened. And marketing usually is the first to make their team redundant. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was let go. But I think there was a huge turning point because at that point in time, I was really, <laughs> that's where the podcast actually came in Yeah. Uh, because I was itching in the probably last couple of years when I was there, I was itching to do something different. And that's where I started the podcast just in my you know, free time. And I just kind of did that as a hobby initially. And I was tempted to just jump in and, and run that full time. But luckily I didn't because I just didn't have enough cash flow to sustain. Myself. It took a while to take off. Yeah. yeah. So, so what were you doing? So I went back and I just took contract work on, which is fantastic. I became a project manager at um, a very well-known university and, and that was paid exceptionally well. And at that point in time, the good thing is that um, depending on your situation, this is not for everyone, you could put it through the company. So mm. I, I did it basically through that way. And because I also had other clientele, I could mix it up and yeah, 
earn the hundred percent and do whatever I could do with it and uh, start to actually build up a nice big asset base in the background while so I was, was working. Was the intention actually, were you doing this going, I just need more runway for the podcast. And so I just wanted to make enough cash to get me going so until the podcast gets big. Or was it just like, no, I'm just going to see how it goes. Just like, what was the thinking? For fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the podcast was, in, was going to be something that I wanted to look as a, a sustainable business. Uh, so I did have that in the back of my mind because right at the beginning, I, I looked at how I make sure that I monetize it. Mm. If I didn't do it at the beginning and have those business decisions, then it would be very hard to sort of implement down the track. Mm. Um, we, we have that problem now. Like we're, we're thinking we got to start now. If we don't start yeah. now, then like it's really hard to tr uh, change to that. Type yeah. Of yeah. After. And then, and can't ask me that question. Um, oh, yeah. recently. In the yeah, last, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I explained and I said, look, the, the whole idea behind actually putting in early on right at the beginning is so that the audience or the listeners get used to it because if they don't get used to it, say, you know, it's three years time and you suddenly just pop these ads in there, they'll go, what the, <laughs> yeah. and they'll go, I thought this was supposed to be a free podcast, yeah, you know, no selling ads. Out. Yeah. So you so kind of lose that attention. When did you start the podcast? Sorry. Yeah. Like Back in 2017, I was made redundant in 2019. Okay. So I had it running. Oh, for you, you were oh, already wow. doing it. Yep. For a couple of years while I was actually at, at the other company. Okay. Let, let me guess. So when you made, when you got made redundant, you must have been laughing. You must have been so happy. <laughs> Yeah, tell me you were. I was, I was. And my wife said to me, you know, you're not going to business. <laughs> she said Why? that, she Why? was not going yeah. into business. Because she's, she went, she's been through the ups and downs with me and there's, mm. it's stressful. She want to do it again. Yeah, she says, I don't want to see that up and down again with you because she's been, she's seen all the business I've been in, you know, every one of them. One of them have succeeded, one of them haven't. And then, you know, it's, it's a constant. And, and especially with a young family, like my kids were only at that point, I think five, no, so three and three and one. Mm. So that was still very young. And my, especially my, my newborn, she was still getting her feet. I mean, now I look back at it, now they're eight and five. I'm very comfortable with having the business now because yeah. it's it's definitely able to do that. I but just, I just want to like, you know, pay my respects because this is like, it's really tough for the your partner. It yeah. really is. And Absolutely. I see it in my partner where like, I don't turn up to the times that I say we, are, we don't go on dates as much. And it, it, it breaks my heart, mm. like literally mm. to see that. Like in Cam would know too. Yep. Yeah. So um. Yeah. It, it, it makes me quite teary inside because I feel like man, our partners do a lot for us. Yeah. Even though they 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 give up a lot, you know, especially having young children. She spent she's full time looking after them. You know. They give up a lot to and, do all and, that. And the like the support as well as like the consistency of money, which like and they can't make decisions to look after the family as well. Exactly. They got to support you. It's That's like right. looking after another baby. Really. Yeah. It's it's extremely hard, and yeah. I. I remember like that first three years to five years and especially when I've also got a child who's got special needs, it's mm. extremely hard. And, mm. and that's, that's where it's very, very stressful yeah. as well because you got to have enough money to be able to not only support the family to live, but also to, to provide enough to be able to attend therapies and sessions to help mm. with special needs as well too. Yeah. So that makes it very challenging. And, and I'm very fortunate that she was very, very supportive over that time because I stayed in to, you know, in my jobs for, for a number of years until I could actually feel like I could afford it. Um, I was actually going to even stay even longer because I only finished up my contract with, yeah, that contract role only just this year in April. Oh, you were still going until this year? Yeah. It was wow. a long contract. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was very lucky. I was like, I was supposed to be only there for six weeks. Yeah. <laughs> just keep extending it. Just keep extending it. I'm like, great. <laughs> I'm not going to price go prices, go. right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I kept increasing. And I'm like, great. I'll, I'll take it. You know, and, and before long, it was three years. I was like, yeah. wow. wow. I, I think this is like a really important lesson as well because people think that man, like they look at maybe you and they go, oh, I just went straight into this podcast and did it for ages. No, nah, no. you like capped your downside big time. Hey, like you were obviously you had a, you, you didn't have the perfect situation. You were still dealing with like obviously kids, um, obviously your wife didn't want you to go into business and all that sort of stuff. But I think, yeah, it's really important that people understand that you shouldn't just like put your house on it. No, yeah, absolutely. I've learned that all, all through the years because it was very easy. Like I can, I know I'm a, a very strong starter and I know that I, I've got the vision. I can do it and I can execute. I'm very much of an action type of orientated person. But when you actually comes to reality, it's not as easy as it sounds because you can have this beautiful vision that the business is going to do really well, but until it actually succeeds, you won't know. And I could have you know, finished up at that corporate company and gone into business, but I would have struggled for maybe two or three years because there was not enough cash flow coming in. Mm. 
And even with COVID, that would have been even worse off because we were relying very heavily on a lot of marketing businesses because that's that was our marketing model. We're relying on, on successful business to be able to pay us to pay for advertising. Mm. And when advertising stops, your whole company, you know, turns upside down. Well, walk us through your podcast because, you know, like not everyone knows property investory. Like mm. how when I say how big this podcast is, if you can run us through on some numbers in terms of listeners, because like definitely over a million, like mm. what, what numbers are you doing right now in terms of the podcast? Well, we've already done over probably over 3 mil of, of downloads. Wow. Yeah. Uh, we've got easily 70,000 to 100,000 downloads a month on average. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers of subscribers, but just based on the following of it, you can kind of gauge with the engagement on it because every person I talk to, they always mention that, oh, I heard you on so-and-so's mm-hmm. podcast. You know, that was a property investory. Um, our database is about 8,000 subscribers, email subscribers at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, these are, the, to me, they're good, solid metrics in terms of its marketing side. But if they're not engaging metrics for me, which is basically my clients, mm-hmm. our revenue, then for me, it's almost like vanity. Like I can say, and I can tell you, you know, on my YouTube channel, I've got something close to about 15, 16,000 subscribers, over 1.5 million downloads. It sounds great. But does it mean anything? Yeah, no, unless, doesn't pay the know, bills. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't pay the bills. And, and that's what I, I went on that tangent for many years because I thought that would help. But I've learned through business, it's, it's great for marketing if you need to use it. But the real true measure of success is how well your clients and your relationships are and how much you're generating through so it's your like business. It's like a quality over quantity type situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot because yeah. like I actually had I, some of, uh, I wouldn't say who in particular because you can pin, pin them down, but they used to say to me, oh, why don't you just focus on the YouTube channel? Because I run a YouTube channel mm. as well. And, um, and I was like, the YouTube channel isn't like my dream. Like that's not what it is. The YouTube channel is just to connect with a lot more people to show, to build a bit of trust with my um my clients and as well as like viewers. Um, I just see it as that it's not going to make me money. That's the whole point because I just don't see it. There are some other businesses that can do that. My business is doing accounting and tax, and I just want to focus on that with my clients and making them happy. That's exactly right, And, and that's the way I see it. So I see all these channels: podcasting, YouTube. Uh, LinkedIn, social media, all that, that's just another avenue of marketing mm. for me anyway. I mean, some people do take and evolve their podcast into a full business, mm. which is what I initially started and had planned to. But after so much effort and time put into it, I couldn't make it work to generate enough ad revenue to sustain, mm. you know, I, I would have had to do maybe 10, 20 million of downloads in order for me to be able to generate enough ad revenue to sustain, you know, what I'm doing right now. And, yeah. and, you know, to do that, it's a lot of work, you know, mm. and you have to do so much outreach and so forth. Whereas what I'm doing right now, it's all about quality and I only need a, a nice solid base of clients, which I have now to be able to generate a, a seven figure business. So it's, it's a lot more for me that, and I, as you said, the podcast at this point in time is more of a trust building exercise and I enjoy it because I love interviewing people. I love learning about their stories. I love sharing that. And for me, that was a vision just to be able to share and give back because I've had so many wonderful guests on my podcast. I just want to give that back to yeah. other people. That the connections also- you build, right? Yeah. Like not just on it, but like afterwards as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So do you want to share a little bit about, and then I want to sort of go back to the whole podcast journey and how you actually grew mm. this thing because selfishly, we've got a podcast in of case course. anyone's noticed. Um, <laughs> Happy to help. But yeah, but also- you know, you mentioned like, it's not like, and Davey said, it's like the, the, the YouTube channel or the podcast is not there. It's, it's, you know, for there to build and do marketing. So what, what are you, what is the podcast generating for you, I guess, in terms of what the business is on the back end? So I've always used this term, even when we we're doing all our video production is the no like trust principle. That's what really the podcast does for us. And it's, in, it's insane that it, it has turned in that way because I didn't realize how much of an impact it had on our business. Same with me. Yeah. I didn't know. Like, it was like, oh, wow, you know, thank you so much for listening to podcasts. I've been on your podcast for the last two years. Mm. I finally made a choice to reach out because you mentioned, oh, you got this fantastic opportunity to have a look at. Yeah. And it was like, wow, I, I, it, it just made my life so much easier because I don't have to sell anything that's cold. Mm. They're already pre-warmed up. They know who it is. And then when they, they call me and just say, it's actually funny <laughs> you talk because I've just hear you every day on the podcast mm. and it makes me like shiver up my spine because I'm going like, I'm just like you. I, I've got nothing special, but I just do the best I can to provide you with amazing content. Mm. But that makes it so much easier because you're not having to sell someone on something that they may not be interested. You're only attracting the best quality clients, especially ones who already have shown 
following engagement and interest in what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. And when they do come to you, all you want to do is just deliver the best customer service for them and, and help them as much as possible. And that's what I, my philosophy is based on. If I can help them achieve what they want to do, then I'm happy. You know, I don't care if I make not much out of it or nothing out of it. That's fine with me. But as long as I've served them and helped them, that's what matters for me. Mm. And that's what always the podcast has been is because intentionally from the start, I've always made sure that I deliver the best content for people. I don't want to be putting crappy audio content in there. I don't want to be putting, you know, interviews that just don't add any value. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the reason why I've been very, very selective on who I put on, especially for sponsorships, those kind of things. I just don't put anything unless it's related or going to add Yeah, value. you're really deliberate about your brand. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so let's um, talk about like all the milestones with your podcast then, right? So if you if we start from the beginning, when did you launch the podcast? You said 2017? Yep, yeah. May 2017. Okay. Uh, so I'll give you a bit of background story behind that because then it puts things into context. Mm -hmm. Probably about a year before that, I was driving to work every day, listening to great podcasts. I had three really great podcasts that were properly related that I always listened to every day. And I really loved them. But the problem I found with them was that they were missing the why behind it because they talked a lot about the how to, you know, they talked about their portfolio and talked about how much money they're making. Very dry stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to turn, turn, turn it into something interesting. And I, I wanted to find out why. Why did these guys do it? What was their story behind it? Where did they grow up? What was the driving factor? Just exactly like what we're doing right now. You're finding out a little bit about my personal history. That was something that was missing. And I thought, could there be someone else that will do it? And I just thought, I'll wait and see. At that same point in time, I also met a met one of my past clients who I did video production with. And um, he was starting to do a bit of property. And then interestingly enough, about 12 months later, I saw him in the magazine, the Australian Property Investment Magazine. And he had a title, Man on Mission, and he had like 12 properties when I had known him only literally 12 months ago with only two. I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> Tell me what you did. <laughs> and, and that kind of got me interested. And I thought, wow, if he can do what he's doing, and he's actually younger than me, but he's also a good close friend of mine. And he just pretty much just learned as much as he could to do what he did. I thought if I could try and up my knowledge, and then I could probably you know do what he's doing. Because the thing I was lacking was knowledge, and I was lacking also finances as well, because I didn't have that money. And I found out he didn't have much money at all. He went for all the cheap stuff, but he was able to figure out how to actually leapfrog to the next one. Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, I thought, hmm, how can I actually find the knowledge I need without having to pay for something? <laughs> Just like my paddle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So I kind of went, hmm, what are the means? Well, maybe podcasting because I didn't want to see people. I, I was happy to just be behind the camera, uh, behind a, a screen, hop on a microphone and just call people and, and just ask questions. I thought, well, if I could convince some of these experts to come onto a podcast, be featured on a podcast to provide their knowledge and me picking their brains with, with questions that I wanted to know, mm -hmm. I could turn this into something. So that's how I got started. And it was basically just that idea. Now that idea sprung up back in the year before in 2016, about December. And I didn't do anything for probably a year before that because that idea had, um, you know, just kind of there. And I thought someone else would do it. Mm. So it took me literally about six months before I actually put the actual action in place and, and pulled it together. And it took a lot of work because there's a lot of background stuff that I had to do. You, you don't realize how much work there is in podcasting. Yeah, yeah. yeah it wasn't like, you know, switching on next day and we're up and running. Yeah. It was six months worth of actually recording all the content, editing it, finding the right kind of stuff to get it done and then putting all the all the mechanisms in place because you've got to do a launch. You can't just go, yep, it's on. And you go, oh, people come in. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It's not like you open not shop and people yeah. you know, come. You've got to actually promote it. Mm. So I had a lot of things leading up to it to be able to get out promotion. So that's basically how it all started. Okay. Well, so what were the major milestones for you? So, you know, when did you were like, oh, this is really turning into something serious. Like I could really do something with this. Well, for the first few months, it was very slow going and I thought, man, is this really worth it? And, and also too, I, I was doing a daily podcast. It wasn't like- just, You were doing daily? <laughs> yeah. Daily? Yeah. So Whoa. I was releasing episodes every single day Whoa. just to try and get the momentum up. And then that's why I meant I had six months of planning. It wasn't like as though I could just bang and go every week I could have one. So we recorded a lot of episodes and I had about three months ahead of schedule so I could actually release it daily. I know it's it insane. <laughs> Okay, no. and then daily. <laughs> daily. Yeah. All right, yeah, so then when did the daily stop? Because you were like, mm, yeah. it's not, you know. Well, it was probably about 12 months afterwards. So I did that for a good 12 months. You did a whole year of daily. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Now, the thing is, I didn't do what brand did, new episodes. Why do you think about this? 
she this just must have been so she's like he's intense. crazy forget yeah. about yeah. it well, I, think, I think we're all yeah. very busy with, yeah. with the kids and all that and it just all happens you oh, know I, wow. I look back at it but the thing is, is I didn't do it all myself that's yeah. the thing remember oh, okay. I was using leverage sources so I had uh, I had hired two journalism interns who do all the editing for me yeah I hired a full-time podcast editor from the Philippines who did all the- you That know, was from your video production the, days. Yeah, yeah, video production days. And yeah, an assistant as well. And they did all that kind of background, you okay. know, put all that together for me. Whilst all I did was just the interviews. Mm. Still, I was involved in the whole process because the first six months was the planning stage and designing how you want the podcast to sound like. But once you get to that stage, it still wasn't easy, but I could rely on those people to help me because otherwise I, I wouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's kind of how I did it. And, and I think that's, that's really important because like business owners, um, the ones that succeed, I feel like, are the ones that are like at learn how to delegate the work from the yeah. start. Letting go. Yeah, yeah. letting go. Because the problem is if you just keep it to yourselves too much, and you learn all the uh, tricks to a trade, then you feel like no one can do a better job. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I totally agree with you. And this is why I've been learning as, I, as I've grown the business and so forth, is that I've got to actually delegate uh, actual responsibility and accountability. And maybe that's probably where I learned it was from the corporate because mm -hmm. I never really did this in my own business beforehand because I never had these tools. Oh, I should mention. But you, you felt like, well, as a result of that, you probably struggled. Struggled, yeah. yeah. And then that's what happened in the first few businesses yeah. is that I struggled because I didn't know how to delegate. I had people, but I was still doing the work. And I think, why am I paying these guys to do the same yeah, stuff? And I can do it better uh, and faster. Exactly. Yeah. But, but then people will eventually get better and faster than you. Exactly. Yeah. And they, they did eventually. But I think with, without that kind of training from the corporate side, because I was paid to also go to leadership programs. I was also, you know, paid to actually learn how to manage and delegate staff. That's where I really learned all their skill sets. You know, I, I had about 15 full-time staff with me when I was working back in corporate. So obviously I had to learn something there um, to do that. And there was no way I could have done it, you know, the way I did now. Mm. So I think those skills really help with where I am now because it teaches you to, even if you've got a small team of four or five people, you really have to set up the responsibilities clearly. Let them be the ones who can actually drive it better because that's the reason why you hire them because they're going to be expert in that field. You don't want to be that expert. Mm. And, and that's kind of where I've been able to do now, you know, where I am with this, this business. Mm. Otherwise I wouldn't, you know, do what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Mm. So how long, uh, sorry, um, how long? Well, I was going to say, can we go back to the milestone? Oh, yeah, 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 down the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how long the milestone? So I think it was about six months when we hit about a half a mil from memory. Six months. Half I a think mil. so. I have, I have to pull out the timeline. It's been so long ago. 500,000 downloads. Yeah. I think that was the, the, either the six month or nine month mark. But um, once we hit that milestone, that's when things start to exponentially grow. And this is the thing I was saying to you, the more episodes that you have, the more you're gonna actually get more traction. Hence the reason why if you have at least 100 episodes already in the can, you know, in the first maybe year or something like that, it will help you move forward much, much faster. Got it. And then at that point in time, after 12 months, I started cutting down and we went down three episodes per week. Now I'm down to two episodes. And that's more than enough sustainable because that allows people to not only listen to your new ones, but for new listeners, go back to listen to your old ones. Because the last thing they want to do is go, oh, heard five and then that's it. What's next? They've got like 300 plus episodes now that yeah. can go back to. They'll, I know some people have told me, they said on the trip down from Sydney to Melbourne, they literally thrashed through. They um, went through the whole yeah. lot. So what were the... Um, what do you feel like were the big things that you did that helped you grow the podcast? Was it just sheer numbers? Surely there was like no, a bit more to no, that. No, definitely. It's those relationships that you build. What's key is to actually build very strong relationships with your guests on the podcast because they're going to be the ones that will share it. Yes, there's going to be a bit of ego for them, which is great because you want to be able to say, look, once you get you know your listeners to listen to it, it's a huge benefit for you because it promotes you and your brand and mm -hmm. you're going to sound great to them. So every time we have our guests that comes on, usually you, you give them some instructions, say, please, you know, share it with your listeners, feel free to promote it on your social medias. And that's where it takes off. You know, I had a guy who, or one of the past guests who had like a few thousand uh, very engaged uh, Facebook followers. Mm. And because of that, they can't seem to all come on and just start listening to the podcast. And that's where the numbers start to grow. And you'll find that only some do it, not all, mm -hmm. but you just have to trust the process because say, you know, maybe a strike wave, maybe 50% of the guests will actually share it with their audience. Most of them usually don't. Mm. Um, but just keep going. It's consistency. Numbers game. Yeah, it's a numbers so game. So you say a lot that um, you like to learn about the guest and like, you know, their journey. What's mm. the most interesting um, guest that you had? You don't have to name their name. No. Um, uh, I know that you did interview some celebrities. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> there's a few celebrities <laughs> I've had on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually mentioning that, one of the celebrities that really, really, resonate with me and I was very very surprised because 
they're so down to earth. Like on the TV, I think they're probably there for a show. And we all know that. It's entertainment. They've got to put on a character. But when you actually have a, a down to down to earth conversation with them, they're the most warmest, kindest people. And they're just so nice to talk to. And they're like you and me. They, they'll just be happy to just to share their knowledge. Mm. Obviously, they've, they've articulated it so well because they've done it on media, all across radios and TV and stuff like that for many, many years. But when you actually delve down and hear about their story and they were like willing to share even things that they've never shared in the public before. I said, look, you know, they said to me, normally I don't, I haven't ever shared this with anyone, but because you've asked, I'm more than happy to share it. And they, they went into so much detail. And a lot of these well-known celebrities that we know have all come from a very, very challenging background, you know, from like maybe commission homes, they've, they've grown up in poverty, all those kind of things. And it sounds like a rags to riches story, but they have gone through so much adversity to be able to lead them to where they are today. Mm. Now, I won't name the names, but there are many of them that have come from that. And the most recent guest that I've had as well too has exactly the same thing. She was pretty much denied on so many jobs. And then finally, after about 20 different jobs, she was able to be given an opportunity. And obviously that's landed to where she is now. Mm. So persistence. Key, yeah, it's persistent. It? Yeah, absolutely. Far out. In terms of like sponsors and stuff, because I'm very interested in this. Mm. Um, it's very expensive to run a podcast, as we know. When did you start getting uh, interest from sponsors and, you know, people reaching out to you? to potentially, you know, advertise and that sort of stuff. And how did you approach it? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because initially when I first started, I was just using those gaps. So as I mentioned earlier in the podcast is that what I did initially, day one, is to make a decision on what you want to insert into the podcast rather than just have a full length of no ads or anything. I made sure I had gaps in there. So I had an intro, a mid-roll and an outro. That gave me an opportunity to be able to insert something. And it doesn't matter if it was a sponsorship or if it's just my own ad. And that's what I did. It was basically call to actions at that point in time. It was set up in that way. So every time that they get to say the middle, it kind of preps and go after this ad or after this you know, sponsor, blah, 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 we're going to come back and listen to that. So that way, once they get used to that, they go, okay, it's normal. And then when you actually introduce it down the track, which for me was actually maybe about two years down the track when I actually introduced really good sponsors onto the podcast, then it's like easily inserted and it's it's normal for them. It's like nothing that's new. Mm. So I guess for the first few years, it was mostly call to actions from us to get them to sign up to the website, build up the database, the email address and so forth. And I think maybe about, I can't remember exactly when, but there was, I started getting these emails directly from all these large hosting companies, podcast hosting specific companies mm. that said, would you like to come over and, and start hosting with us? Because I think back then I was hosting with, um, oh, Lipsing. Have Lipsing, you heard? Yeah, yeah Lipsing. Yep. That, that was my first hosting service because everyone used it overseas mm. and here. And I thought, all right, I'll just stick with that and do what everyone else is doing. Um, great for metric tracking, great for all those kind of things, but it was really crap for actually inserting into ads and stuff like that because you, you hadn't known that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's pretty norm in most of these hosting platforms that you can insert dynamic ads pretty easily in mm -hmm. click of a button. But back then, it was not possible. Mm -hmm. So this company that was starting out quite new and they're based in Sydney, um, reached out to me and said, I think it was just one of the salesperson reached out and said, look, uh, are you happy with your, your current one? Would you like to save some money? And I thought, of course I would. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I was paying like 60 bucks US a month. And I thought, oh, of course I, I'd be happy to do that. Um, jump over here. We won't charge you anything. Um, we'll do some kind of ad revenue split and we'll find you excellent sponsors. I said, well, what, what's there to lose? I just basically jump across there. They monitor all my traffic. And if they get sponsors, shove them in or insert them in easily. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, I could save myself 60 bucks a month, which is exactly what happened. It was probably about maybe a month later. That's when they came back to me and said, hey, by the way, I've got this really great sponsor. It's actually quite well-known brand in Australia, property related. We're going to run a campaign with you. Um, would you like to do it? And then when they sent to me the numbers, I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. <laughs> Huge numbers. <laughs> Huge man. numbers, yeah. Because I mean, we're doing, as I said, over already a million downloads you know, already. And, and that, that's why they probably saw that. And they found that we'll rank number one as well on iTunes. And that's mm. probably how they found us. So they reached out. And because of that, they just struck a deal with this particular sponsor. And it ran for a good probably three months straight. And I was paid you know, a, a very, very handsome reward for that. And I thought, wow, if it's as simple as that, I just switch it on, <laughs> you guys do the work. Yeah. And that's that's what happened. The, the relationship kept going and they kept bringing lots of great big brands on like Domain, Stockman, yeah. Moore, all very much property related. And it, it just slotted in very nicely. So uh, this was not the typical way for going out to find sponsors. This was actually done by the hosting platform. And for me, it actually worked out really well because it was an avenue, like 50-50 kind of split. 
you know, and it was worthwhile because for them, they did all the work they to find the them. You didn't have to lift your finger. And I did yeah. lift finger and I still got paid. And they built the network for you as well. They had the network. Already. They had the network yeah. for me as well too. Not only that, it also increased my brand as well because I was associated with such big brands as well. Mm. So you can use that on the website, promote it and all that. Yeah. So it was And you're huge. piggybacking off their pricing as well because like if it were you, you probably price a lot less. In actual fact, I would have probably priced a bit higher oh, to be wow. honest. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because okay. they said that what I was offering was high. And I thought, no, that's okay. But you guys are doing the work. So I don't mind, mm. you know, I'll take what it is. Because at that point in time, I was focusing on growing the business in terms of actually building a directory and network mm -hmm. of successful property experts, buyers, agents, um, mortgage brokers, et cetera. So that you wasn't know. your monetization mm. focus? Yeah, that so. was my monetization focus. And at the same time, I was also doing property development. So I jumped into quite a lot of different things once again, but I was, I was still exploring. I was trying to find out what was going to work for our business. And at that point in time, I had so many different revenue streams. I had affiliate marketing, I had sponsorship, uh, directory marketing, et cetera. So just seeing which one would take off. Um, obviously one of them did, which has led us to where we are now. So mm. it sounds like, um what your uh like the success of your business was a de delegation like mm. delegating the work and whether it's outsourcing it to um philippines or um to uh virtual uh, assistants uh, virtual yeah. assistants or like even just like other companies um or and then um uh, building relationships like Absolutely. Building very strong relationships the key i think to any successful business for me anyway is building relationships so when i started the video production business and prior to that, I also did just some podcasting. The success of where I drove the traffic to the website to build those clients was all those relationships with those, let's say joint venture partners, because ultimately if they can promote your product or your service for you to their network, you're leveraging off a huge amount of their already existing traffic and driving mm. it back to you. And if you can do that well and do that on multiple occasions, you know, you'd be off on a really, really good, you know, home run initially mm. so that, that's what i did and, and exactly how the podcast grew was because of those relationships so mm. obviously after this ask your guests and say hey you know would you be happy to promote us yeah. and as mm. i said to you i'm more than happy and that, that hopefully will bring you guys some you know, additional traffic mm. and Appreciate new it. customers what's the plan i guess in the next few years because you said you're someone who can't sit still and you always got like something new so is there anything new or is like you're just focusing on this at the moment <sighs> well i don't have anything new but i mean i want to still i want to continue to pursue my passion of sustainable energy sources. I've been really, really interested in the green space more lately. I mean, even the last probably year or so, just due, not due to COVID only, but also how things are changing and evolving. And, you know, seeing Elon Musk, you know, he's one of my inspirations, getting to solar, uh, electric cars, oh, so many wonderful things that are actually gonna help the planet. I wanted to, you know, do my part as well too. Not only just for me, but for my future generations, such as my kids, kids and so yeah. forth. And you know, there is a, an untapped opportunity in the green space and there's actually a lot of potential, not only just money to be made, but also great social good as well too that you can actually do. So that's something I want to continue to go through and impact and I can do it through the business because what we currently do in terms of financing, we can also push it into the green space as well. So it's a win-win thing. But ultimately, if there's a way to be able to find out how we can distribute green hydrogen as an example, which is a, a thing that I'm passionate about looking into more, uh, then we can actually power a lot of our, our vehicles, power a lot of the things that go on using green technology rather than using, you know, fossil fuel burning uh, coal. So such a left field thing. Yeah, it is yeah. so like, left field. What but are you doing now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, right now we're having an energy crisis yeah. um, and it's, it's something that's needed. Huge. Yeah. And th that's why I see there's a huge opportunity because what I'm funding right now with these deals that we're doing, we're funding development sites. Mm. And if if I can tap into the those sites that need to build factories and plants that create green energy that's the yeah. perfect space to be back in and, and like literally or probably one of uh, most of the smartest people in the world are thinking about this yeah you know in a mask there's the guy from elastian he's talking about yes. it yes yeah so it's a andrew forrest from yes. you know he, he twiggy yeah for yeah Forge mescules i mean he he designed in a very short space of time a, a hydrogen fuel based truck you know which would transport all these materials and it works beautifully mm -hmm. and that's where i think hydrogen will be very very powerful because you can do long haul distances it's going to be a, co a fraction of the cost to say for example yeah. electric and, and i'll tell you batteries. this like australia is like we live in a very like nice um standard of living so we don't have these problems yes. but you know i've got employees in the philippines and you know, they, they get a blackout and they're blackout for like weeks. Yes. It can go for weeks. Yes. And they even have a backup battery source in the back because of the problems that they're having. So 
I totally understand. Yeah, it, it's going to be something. And I think China at the moment, from what I'm hearing and seeing, is that taking the lead on this. And yes. if they dominate on that, then they could potentially be the next world dominant power mm -hmm. over the US. Because when you think about it, we need energy. It doesn't matter what which country you're in. You can't ignore you, it. You can't ignore it. And where are you going to get it? From our limited resource, from the sun or whatever resources we have, yeah. we don't have to generate more carbon. Wow, it anyway, is interesting. Yeah, so it's very. Yeah. Interesting. That's why I'm saying there's a huge field. So I think for me, I want to pursue that, but I will continue to grow the business because at the moment we're at a stage where a lot of things are getting automated. We're putting better systems in place. Um, we're growing very, very rapidly. There's there's a great team. I'm just building the culture, you know, and so that way my team can continue to support and do the things that I don't need to do. Yeah, mm. Amazing. So have you got any, um, you know, last question, I guess, is uh, have you got any other advice just in general in regards to whether it's property, um, starting businesses or multiple businesses? <laughs> um, just parting words, I guess, before we wrap it up. Yeah, I, I think the challenge with any person starting a business is you got to really, really be realistic what you what you want to do and also be passionate thing because a lot of these businesses I've gone into is due to my passion. You know, the Dragon Boat ones because I love my sports property because I love property. You know, you got to do something that you're passionate about and as you heard when I did something that was not my passion like just a drop putting in something to mm. <laughs> you go, what? <laughs> so yeah, without that passion you don't have the drive and that's where you need to drive it in the business because that's so, so important. Once you have that passion the rest of it falls into place and you'll take action no matter what. You know, I still work very long hours, but that's because I love what I do. You know, I don't treat it as being work. I treat it as something that I'm passionate about. And hours just pass by so quickly. And, and that's why I'm saying once I find that next passion in say, for example, green hydrogen, I'll probably be engrossed in there. My team will just continue to do all the things that need to be done in the background. Mm. So I think that's probably my parting words. Find a passion that you love to do. That's gonna be a sustainable business. And also to just make sure that you take action and, and it doesn't matter if you fail, it's okay. You just learn from those just like what I did because I've done so much, you know. Yeah, you've done heaps and I know. yeah, super wise words as well. So um, I guess the last question uh, besides this, which we always ask is like, if people want to connect you and they want to find you, um, where's the best place to find you? Sure, you can hop onto my website at propertyinvestory.com. So to spell it, it's just property investor and then you just add a Y at the end. Dot com. Um, you can reach out and you know text me on my mobile on 0499 88 1040. Yeah, always yeah, happy to, to have a chat. And yeah, that's probably the easiest and fastest way you can connect with me as well. Amazing. Thanks nice. for coming on the show. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Perfect. Thanks for listening to the Level Asian podcast. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.